Are you tired of watching shows that only give you general social media theory and expect you to figure out how to apply it to your own industry? Join us for this week's episode of Social Chatter, the industry's longest running social media marketing news talk show. Not only will you learn the latest breaking news, but you'll also gain practical advice on how to apply it. Now here's your host, Christian Karasevich. Welcome everyone to Social Chatter, your weekly social media marketing news talk show. This is episode, I got to check here, 280. I think I got this right, 280. Um, We have a lot of great social media news topics that we want to discuss with you this week. There's certainly a lot of news and obviously Facebook and Instagram predominantly, you know, they, they dominate the news most of the time. And this week though, LinkedIn is in the news with some really good company page updates. Uh, I really like these. I'm actually excited to talk about them with uh, with Jim and our guest, uh, Melanie Diane Howell. Um, we're also going to be talking about some updates to your YouTube channel. So if you're wondering, for example, well, what kind of channels are the people that are tuning into my you know YouTube channel and subscribing? Uh, what are they? You know, what else are they watching? Who else are they watching? You know, learn more about your competitors. Um, we've got some YouTube uh, channel analytics updates. In addition to that, we do have a Facebook update as well, uh, an update for shop that will it will apply to most of you, not all of you, but a, a good chunk of you. But um, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and bring you on. Uh, it's great seeing you as well. Good to see you. So I know we actually had Melanie on this week, actually, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. She was on Launch Your Live, uh, episode 51. It'll be out uh, in about a little less than two weeks. Uh We'll actually release episode 50 on uh, this upcoming Monday uh, and mm-hmm. uh, just released episode 49. So, uh, yeah, I've yeah. Been, been busy with that. Definitely. Yeah. So go uh, go check out the Launch Your Live podcast on your favorite podcast player. I don't know if, if you have the link, Jim, feel free to drop that in the comments. Um, but definitely go check that one out. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring on Melanie here. Just had to, sorry, I had to make sure she was here. I saw her like disappear from the screen. So uh, I'm going to go and bring on Melanie. Um, we're going to kick things off. Got a lot of topics to talk about and some good questions for her. So Melanie, good to see you again. Hey, good morning. Yeah. Yeah. I was grabbing my pin down there from uh, my drawer. So I'd probably disappeared on screen there for a second. <laughs> no worries. No I appreciate worries. you waiting until I was back on screen. <laughs> All good. I was like, okay, well, like out of the corner of my eye, you know, the whole thing is like when you're on live video, you want to be on camera. You want to typically try to look at the camera and, you know, depending on your, your camera setup. Uh, a lot of times your camera is right in front of you and, you know, your laptop is down uh, underneath it or it's off to the side or you get screens. So, yeah. So out of the corner of my eye, yeah, I was like, OK, where'd you go? So uh, <laughs> you want to just uh, do me a favor. Tell our viewers just a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Yeah. So my name's Melanie Diane Howe, and that, that's spelled weird. D-Y-A-N-N is that's my middle name. But yeah, I love I'm very passionate about social media because I think it's such a great way for people to make really good enriched connections and to put themselves out there, really. And that's what I'm all about is getting people to put themselves out there and create great content. And uh, live video is definitely the way I like to do it. So I teach people how to level up their live videos. And for those of you who haven't been in her Facebook group, um, she does have, she puts out a lot of really good uh, videos and tutorials, basically. And so she was doing one, I think, a couple weeks ago. We were talking gear. We were talking microphones. Um, I think you were comparing the Shure SM7, or F, sorry, MV7 with, yeah. I think, an Elgato, uh, yes. is it what, the Wavelink, I think, right? Yeah, Elgato Wave 3, which is actually yeah. the one that I ended up keeping. Uh, yeah, so I love to play around and explore cameras and I don't know I, I just geek out on figuring things out like that's really truly what I love to do is to tinker and I'm always tinkering with stuff so learning new things and new tricks and I think I'm becoming known for my scrappiness that's for sure and here's the thing you have to do that if you want to stay ahead you know a lot of people uh they, they say well hey I don't have the money to start on something so then they wait until they get the money well then you're going to fall further behind mm-hmm. um you know and so uh the key thing there is instead of waiting, find ways to get yourself moving and to keep things uh, moving forward. You know, that's the only way you're going to grow. It's the only way you're going to learn from, you know, mistakes and whatnot that you make along the way and you're going to improve and get there faster. So, yep. um, so Jim, uh, do you want to kick things off by the way? Yeah, let's, uh, let's start out talking about some updates to LinkedIn company pages. Definitely. Yeah. We have some uh, really big updates from LinkedIn. I think this week, um, you know, 
how, how much are you like, I guess the first question is like, how many of you actually are using LinkedIn company pages? How about, you know, Jim's got one. I know I've got one. Melanie, you've got one a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I mean, LinkedIn company I, pages. I actually, I actually have several pages and I'll tell you where, uh, company pages can be very powerful for live shows, podcasts is you can create a page for your show, have a link to where your show resides, whether it be Facebook, YouTube, and then post episodes on the page. Because if you put it in your personal feed, it kind of disappears. The other thing is if you don't have a company page for your experience and someone clicks on it, it goes to the search results for LinkedIn. So I like what they're doing with LinkedIn company pages. I think it's uh, it's also, it's like having a map location. It's another place for people to find out information for free. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think it's a, a powerful tool. So what do we have going on this week? I know we've got a short video we want to play to kind of demo these. Um, what, what, what do you want to do first? You want to show them yeah, the let's article? Yeah, let's play the video yeah. first. Cool. Let's play this video, yes. And so, Jim, I don't know if you want to walk through kind of what these are. I mean, there's three updates, I think, this week, right? Right. Yeah, so that so they've got the company tab, which is really meant more for companies that have uh, employees, right? Like I, I'm a, a solopreneur, so I don't know if that would work for me. But it's allowing employees to share content. It can be curated. It's it's all about, right? We hear this word a lot in social these these past couple of years. It's about building community. Uh, also, I think the the product pages is interesting. Uh, I'd like to see how that works a little bit more because you can actually put products in there and so um, i'm thinking that uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that and uh and then of course stories for pages of course stories just kind of like twitter fleets uh is only available on the mobile device right now and i i'm really not sure how many people that use linkedin are doing it on their mobile device. I think maybe it used to be like if you were networking, you might have it out because you'd connect with someone there. But uh, I think a lot of us, I don't know, me personally, I do a lot of stuff from my desktop. And so I don't know that I always get into the stories on LinkedIn because when I'm on LinkedIn, I'm thinking more desktop. I don't think of it as a, a mobile device. What about you, Mel? Yeah, um, it's interesting that you said, I remember a while back uh, when the mobile stats really started climbing and it was like all these stats were showing that everybody's using mobile when they're using social media. LinkedIn was the one that was still, I think at the time, this has been a couple years ago, it was still predominantly used on desktop uh, because I do think that there's a difference. You're in that professional mindset. I always say every social media channel has a a culture, but also a mindset. Like when when I'm scrolling Instagram, you know, my, my objective, if you will, is different than when I get on Facebook. And of course, LinkedIn is different. I'm not getting on LinkedIn to catch up with, you know, my friends, babies and puppies, right? You're getting on there to learn, mm -hmm. to grow, to network. You're in a professional mindset. And I think that that kind of goes along with what you were describing is we're in that mindset when we're sitting in our desk, we're sitting in our office, when we're sitting down at, the, at our computer, it is different. But I do think that more and more people are starting, I think LinkedIn, we saw a big uptick in usage again, it kind of had a comeback, uh, you know, a year and a half, year, two years ago, we started to see more influencers using LinkedIn, people that you wouldn't expect to use LinkedIn, like Rachel Hollis, for example, um, you know, I always use that as an example. I do think more and more people are using it mobily because the content has changed. I mean, the culture of the content has changed. So this whole stories thing very well could even add add more of that, uh, where we see more people will start to reach for their phone and actually use it because, again, that experience they're getting is different and feels more like some of the other platforms. It's starting to, for sure. I'm excited about this feature um, because I just think, I think there are probably a lot of really really creative ways that companies can use it. And there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, you know, for starters, okay, so the company tab for community building within your organization, this is straight up Facebook workplace, right. except you're not paying Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, with Facebook, you're paying Facebook. For LinkedIn, they're not looking to charge you for this. Right. And, you know, this is a very interesting, it, it's sort of an interesting business model, I guess, in a way. I mean, you have to remember LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. Chances are, this is going to, you know, it's it's also like how Apple does things. They give away the software with the purchase of the laptop. Same exact process here. You know, if I'm Microsoft, I'm giving this away to businesses because I'm going to be making it up on business licenses for subscriptions to their software, things like that. Mm -hmm. So makes a lot of sense that they would do this. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges, I think, within the workplace with, you know, 
uh, with with keeping your employees updated, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in the office or if they're now mostly remote, it's hard to do that. You know, and um, I, I don't think a lot of companies really do a good job of that because they they almost overcomplicate it. They send out too many emails, for example, um, but then the employee's too busy to read those emails. So I think the one thing I really like about this is that with the company tab, you can highlight the news, but you can also highlight the employees. Right. So, you know, this way it gets people into using LinkedIn more. Um, so I, I like this. I really do. I mean, you know, if I'm a business, um, I think that uh, I would definitely, I should be using this to your points, Jim. Yeah. But I should also be, yeah, go ahead. I wanted, I wanted to say, I actually, if you want, if you want to do a share screen, I'm going to actually show Leticia yeah, sure. who answered a question. Yes. The answer to her question about should she have a company page? And, and yeah, let's go ahead and bring, let's bring her question up real quick. So let me see. So Jim, she says, you know, uh, she's a business coach. And so she's wondering, should she make a company business page on LinkedIn? Awesome. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's bring up your screen share. So, Here we go. so this is your, this is your profile, Letitia. This is what I see as a, as a visitor. And if you're de definitely doing business to business, this is what I was talking about. This is your experience. It says you're the founder of this company. Well, when I click on this, this is what I end up getting. I'm now looking at other coaches, other people related to you. So my short answer would be absolutely. You need to get a company page out there because people are not going to stay on your profile. And so, uh, you know, as an example, I'll go real quick. As you see, I have quite a few pages. So, so actually, hold on. Before you go to yours, Jim, what did you click on there? On I, I just clicked on where it says she's the founder of okay, and CEO. Perfect. And so it took okay. me to search. Okay. So if I go to, um, let me see here. We'll go to Launch Your Live. Okay. So we created a page for Launch Your Live. And as you can see, we, we've got, we got followers that we've got. We're able to have a cover banner. We also are able to have a link to our latest podcast. And this is always going to be there. The problem with the normal feed in LinkedIn is that it's just like all the other news feeds. It's all going to be a mix of our connection. As your connections grow, it's going to be difficult to, to do that. And so this is on both Christian and my have this as part of our experience. And it allows us to, uh, you know, put our, t our title and descriptions out there. And I have Christian on his uh also adds the actual individual mm -hmm. episodes under his uh, experience yeah. as well. So, yeah, so that, that's a short answer to, uh, yeah, I, I always say get a LinkedIn company page. So then she has another question. So now, obviously, and Melody, you can feel free to chime in here mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, everybody's, when they start using social media for business, everyone is told, oh, you need to, they're, they're told incorrectly, basically. They're told, or maybe it's just, it's worded wrong. They're told to go join social media. And what do they do? They go join every single platform. Yeah. And then they're like, they don't realize, oh my gosh, these actually all take a lot of work. And so they're, you know, they're on Facebook and they've got a Facebook profile and a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And, oh, they decided to create a Facebook group and a YouTube channel and a Pinterest channel. So this can quickly spiral out of control. Um, we know that Clubhouse has been in the news as of late. You know, it's basically... Mm, it's sort of a hybrid between a podcast and a radio show, except mm -hmm. you can actually talk uh, live. So, um, so she has a question here, you know, and her question is uh, for someone who's thinking about adding another social media platform to promote their business. Would you suggest LinkedIn or clubhouse? Great question. This is a really, really good question, especially one right now. And back to what you were saying, I do think that so many people, they fall into this trap, especially as they're kind of starting their business or starting their journey with social as they go, they try to be everywhere. And that is going to do a couple things. It's going to create burnout for one. And it's also going to be very challenging for you as you're getting started. So, you know, I just always recommend pick one platform or two platforms and just go all in on those platforms because what you're going to do is you're going to kind of like stretch those muscles and work those muscles and you'll get a flow. You'll start to kind of create your own process. You'll start to feel, feel out what content works and then you can start to add other platforms. But what you're going to need is you're going to need systems and you're going to need processes because like I said, next thing you know, you're going to get burnout and you're going to be all over the place and you're going to be wearing yourself out. So when we talk about adding platforms, you do have to be kind of strategic and think like, well, which one makes the most sense? And so this is a great question, LinkedIn versus Clubhouse. The platforms are extremely different. So they are not an apples to apples comparison. Um, to be really honest with you, because Letitia's profile is not optimized, I mean, she said here that she's really not put any focus on it. 
you're going to be starting from scratch um, over there. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get going over there. I she um, I think she said she um, has courses uh, too, maybe. I think I saw that. Yes. But, um, you know, LinkedIn is a great place, but it depends on who you're coaching. Are you coaching professionals? If you're coaching professionals, if you're coaching people that are trying to leave their nine to five job, well, LinkedIn is full of those people. So you can absolutely market yourself over on that platform. And you can repurpose a lot of the content you're creating for a blog, uh, for Facebook even, and you can repurpose that content on LinkedIn. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. So you don't have to like create brand new content that's custom to LinkedIn. Um, I would always say start with, um, uh, you know, repurposing. She says, yes, I coach professionals. So, I mean, I think it's a great place. Now, when it comes to Clubhouse, Here's what I say about Clubhouse. Clubhouse is it's absolutely incredible. Um, there is a there is a really good podcast episode that I'm going to recommend. Uh, Amy Porterfield and Tiffany Lee Bymaster did this really great podcast episode, and they talked about Clubhouse. And Tiffany ha, uh, has done a really good job of explaining it, kind of like what is it and how you can actually get results from it. Because here's the thing: you can get on Clubhouse and you can spend a lot of time on there and not get any results. So you're going to have to have an optimization there. And what I mean by that is. Clubhouse is networking. It's you being in an audio room, hanging out with people, talking on stage, asking questions, and networking. What do you do when you network? If you go to a place and you you meet these people, you have to have them, you have to have a place for them to go, to buy from you or to learn from you. So you're gonna need, if you're gonna be on Clubhouse, you're gonna need to have a lane to send them down so that they can follow you somewhere else, you know, whether it be Instagram and they can hang out with you there. You're gonna have some calls to action that you have to have ready for them. Or or you're really just gonna be spinning your wheels and wasting time. So as long as you have a home base to drive that traffic to, then Clubhouse is probably gonna be get you your fastest results. Um, but you do have to be strategic and intentional because you can also, uh, you can waste a lot of time over there. It's a great platform and it's awesome. But if you're not intentional or strategic, you're going to just kind of spin your wheels and waste a little bit of time. So I know that didn't give her a d direct answer, but um, I mean, I, I think if you're, need, if you're looking for a super fast, quick update or quick push, then get on Clubhouse, hang out, check it out. Go check out that episode. It's on Amy Porterfield's podcast, uh, which is called the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. It's a recent episode that they did, and it's really, really, really good. It gives you kind of quick crash course. Yeah, and I, and I would just add to that, you know, if you've got a good presence, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter, that's the one profile link that you're allowed to put into Clubhouse. Because right now, when you really haven't built out your LinkedIn, uh, people aren't going to see that. But I would actually recommend, Letitia, even if you're going to go like more into Clubhouse at first, you definitely want to update your LinkedIn mm -hmm. if you're in the B2B space, because sure. that's really where a lot of people uh, look for business professionals. And they're going to kind of look at that. And, you know, they're not, you know, I, I, as a business person, I'm not going to go, oh, let me go check out your Instagram. I, that's that's just my perspective. <laughs> well, I think I, you make a great point, Jim. And, and even if Letitia's not let's say, active on LinkedIn. She does need to make sure it's complete. I always use this analogy that it's what Letitia, you know, your profile, let's, I mean, I want you, Letitia, in the comments to tell us what day you're going to reserve uh, 30 minutes of your time to just get that profile updated and optimized because it's re it really is important because what's happening right now is let's say somebody you meet on Clubhouse or somewhere else even, you know, their platform of choice is LinkedIn. They're going to go look for you on LinkedIn. And when they arrive at your profile, it looks like you're closed. It looks like your business isn't open. It's kind of like when I walk down the super cute street in the touristy town and I have all these shops to choose from. Well, how do I decide? I only have I only have an hour to spend here. How do I decide which shops I'm going to go in? I look at the signage. I look at what their business is. I look at the windows. I look at how is what is it? Does it fit me? And then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to walk in that store. Your LinkedIn profile could be that storefront that somebody's seeing, and they're not going to go walk in and learn more from you, learn about you. So even though you're not fully like using the platform to publish content, that may be their first place to look for you. And if they look for you there, a lot of people are used to seeing, oh, they're not really active. But if they can click a link for your website or they can click a link for something else, they can go check you out somewhere else where you are actively publishing content. So get that storefront updated because right now it looks like you're closed for business, right? And I always use that analogy. So let us know what day you're going to make it happen. She says, I will update my LinkedIn profile, promise. What day is it going to happen, Letitia? That's love what it. I want to know. Love it, Mel. <laughs> and I got to, yeah, I got to say, I, I love the fact that, you know, we're, we're getting people to uh, set those hard deadlines you know, because here's the thing, like, Jem, you and I can even attest to this. I mean, we were looking to launch the podcast. And what was the one thing we did? We kept, we're like, Make we're almost ready. We're almost ready. What was that? 
making excuses. Exactly. We were like, okay, we're just going to put it out there and we put it out there and it's done extremely well. Um, so yeah, definitely set that date. And again, I mean, Jim, I don't know if you have any tips. How much time do you think it would take to set up a profile? Just quickly set up one. I, I think, I think to, to Mel's point, I think she could probably do it in an hour or two. I mean, you, you a lot of it is filling out the information. They actually kind of walk you through step by step. You need to add this, add that, uh, you know, and then you can just kind of build on it. I think, the hardest part is probably really putting an about that means something, right? Kind of like who you are uh, and and things of that nature, uh, you know, what services you offer, maybe having some links to take people to your website, et cetera, making sure your uh, headshot is uh, current, you know, not something from, you know, 15 years ago. And I think the other thing too is at some point you want to have a banner. You know, if you want a couple of examples of some people that, that really crush it with, uh, LinkedIn, Judy Fox is is one, as well as um, Melanie uh, Dodaro uh, are a couple of really good uh, profiles and you know professionals in in uh, LinkedIn as well. And uh, actually, I need to check out Mel's uh, LinkedIn and make sure I connect with her as well. So, and yeah, those are definitely uh, those are good people to connect with on LinkedIn because uh, you know that's their specialty. I mean, their specialty mm-hmm. is LinkedIn. So, um, so if you're looking for a good example, yeah, go check those out. Um, Awesome. This is really good, by the way. So, uh, so Jim, uh, do we have any? Uh, so that's one update for LinkedIn. Obviously, the the company tab. I know the other thing we've got. They've got the speaking of this. They've got product pages. Uh, the ability to add lead gen forms right to your product pages. So they've got that being added. Um, and then I know obviously they got the stories feature added for uh, for company pages. Uh, what do you all think about these updates? I mean, from a business perspective, how do I use these? How do I tap into them? <laughs> Probably I'm going to let Jim lead this one. So I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to admit something. So LinkedIn, you know, I think a lot of us years ago, we created that LinkedIn profile because we were told to, because it was kind of like your online resume, right? So you created a LinkedIn profile, you got on LinkedIn. When did you use LinkedIn? When you were looking for a new job, right? That was when you looked and then you got your new job. And then what'd you do? You didn't, you didn't hang out on LinkedIn anymore. So it used to be this platform where everyone was like, really networking for job purposes. They were looking for jobs. They were doing that. And that's why they were using the platform. But then it made this big shift to now it is full of great content. And so when that shift kind of happened, I really returned to LinkedIn uh, probably four years ago. And I really started using the platform. And I got really passionate about it. And I got really passionate about getting people to start using this platform to like, you know, for Letitia, for example, hey, share your gifts with the world. Go all in take that content strategy and go with the content marketing strategy and use LinkedIn for it. Um, But then a lot of people started getting on LinkedIn and hanging out there. And then a lot of people started selling more. And now, I mean, I can barely hang out on LinkedIn because I get so many DMs from people that, you know, I always say they want to jump right in the sack with me. Like I was, you know, dating, social media is dating, right? But they're like trying to go right to home base. (laughs) They're like, buy my products. Here's my website. And I'm like, I don't even know who you are. So it has become noisy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would, I really have sort of backed off because it's like, okay, it's too noisy for me. I got to focus, whatnot. But Mm -hmm. I I really am intrigued about the updates because I do think that LinkedIn is aware of this problem because it really is a problem. Um, and they want people to have a good experience. And so I do, I was excited to learn that they're making updates because to me, they're thinking about the users. They're trying to create a good user experience. So I definitely am here taking notes as well. Uh, so I can't wait to hear what Jim's thoughts are. But I do think one thing, if it, it would be helpful, if, if you guys could break down for the audience, what's the difference between a company page, a showcase page, and now these product pages. So, I mean, give give them that breakdown because I do think that people probably need to understand those different layers, if you will. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think the showcase uh, pages are more meant for like brands where they're they're really just kind of showing some of the things. The company page is really, I think, for most of us, you know, to to really put stuff out there, updates about our company that we kind of want to keep out there. We can also share, uh, like as an example, Christian, if he has a, uh, you know, a social chef's page could share some of the articles that he's actually talking about in the show to his profile. Uh, the other thing you can do with a company page is is you get three hashtags that you can highlight on your page. Those three hashtags allow you to engage on post with that hashtag as your company page which is kind of an interesting uh, 
feature of it in and of itself. I mean, so they're really, and, and then product pages are new. I haven't really played around with one yet, but uh, I could see where companies want to maybe be able to sell their product right off the page. So that's actually something I'd like to look into further because I do work with some businesses that that might actually be a really good thing for them. It's just another place to highlight what they offer and maybe you can actually get a purchase straight off of your, your company page. You know, and um, Leticia has a question here, by the way. Um, but before we do that, uh, so like, yeah, in the showcase page feature, I mean, that's the way for you to highlight um, unique brands, uh, business units, or initiatives. So it's almost like uh, an offshoot of a LinkedIn company page, if you think of it like that, like almost like giving your product a page for itself. Um, those are also, they're very reserved as far as who actually gets access to those. So those are for right. typically major, 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 major brands. So if you're a solopreneur, you're probably not going to get access to that one. Um, this, you know, this is good. These are good features though. I mean, like the fact that, you know, they are like, even though LinkedIn's been slow expanding things, you know, the, the thing is though, look at like, I mean, years ago, Jim, I think you and I talked about this all the time about like how uh, LinkedIn was like, they were so behind with everything. And now mm -hmm. it's like, oh, they're adding features, but like, oh, everybody already has these. But you're, I think with this update this week, you're seeing a lot of big updates that are showing the growth that LinkedIn is preparing for. Um, so I really like these updates. I mean, and then we get to the last uh, LinkedIn company update this week, and that's LinkedIn stories for pages. Um, what do you guys think about that one? I mean, you know, are you using stories in general or? I, I've used it a little bit, uh, but I'm just not like, it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I know some people are really liking the LinkedIn stories. Now, I will say that you can, I believe, put a link in your LinkedIn story, right? So with, uh, mm -hmm. I think with Instagram, it takes a little bit longer before you get that quote unquote swipe up uh, capability in your story. So I think that that's a interesting feature. Um, and then, uh, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a, the same thing, right? It lasts for 24 hours. That's my, my issue, right? It's the whole short form content versus long form content. Uh, I think that works for some people, but, uh, I think especially like if you're a service business, I, I don't always know that, uh, short form content that's going to disappear in 24 hours necessarily helps you. Um, you know, and it's kind of like, we've talked about this before, Christian, it seems like, all the platforms keep copying each other's features. I mean, you know, fleets has come out. Uh, it, what's interesting is LinkedIn and messaging for a while has allowed both audio and video messages one-on-one. -on -one. And now, as we talked about last week, Twitter is going to start to allow audio in DMs, right? You've already got that in Facebook. So it kind of becomes like, what platform do you really want to spend all your time on? And I also uh, like Laura's comment about like, the, the spam problem seems to be a problem across all the platforms. And uh, I think that's uh, people that are selling some sort of course that uh, they, they tell people, like, just throw it out everywhere and hope that somebody will take the bait. Yeah, no, definitely some good points. And I know uh, before we move on here and um, Melanie, I'll get your, get your thoughts real quick on stories for pages. Um, we do have a couple questions. I also want to make sure we get to. So I know Leticia's got a question real quick and um, I think Clara has one as well. But let's let's talk stories real quick. Um, so Melanie, what, what's your thoughts on, you know, stories for pages? How can, a, can a business tap into this? I mean, should they, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back down. It goes down to the, the personality of your business. I think stories can be a really great way for, you know, to Jim's point, it is short form content. So I think, I still think it's great. It can be used. It's going to require work. You're going to have to have that journalist approach to your business. I think that a lot of people want to outsource their social media. I do not believe in outsourcing your social media because unless you have a very large budget, because you literally social media is meant to be, you're showing the culture of your business. You're showing what's going on. Yeah. You're, you have strategy and you have, you know, stuff that you're strategically planning, but you also need to be spontaneous with your content because if you're in the middle of, you know, an event that's happening and something really cool happens, well, you can't, call your social media manager and say, hey, um, we had this thing happen. Can you post about it? That's ridiculous. Like, get your phone out and post about it. So I do think that businesses need to be active in their um, in what they're doing. So with stories, it's going to require that a little bit, I think. I think that stories could be a great way to show behind the scenes. It could be a great way to kind of like, like lower that barrier of entry, like let people in, have some personality. I think that we see that with Instagram stories, with Facebook stories, is that it doesn't have to be polished. It's like live video. We, that's why we, I think we all love live video is that 
It doesn't have to be like overly produced and polished. It's meant to be raw. It's live. Stories, in my opinion, is kind of the same way. And so you can really let a little bit more of your personality shine in those stories. And of course, with LinkedIn, it being this, you know, little bit more buttoned up platform, if you will. Um, you know, that's kind of a perspective. I actually have a podcast episode le- releasing today about professionalism and how it's just a term. But, you know, I think LinkedIn is per- perceived this way. But again, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Christian, that they are create. they're doing this, they're trying to enhance the customer experience and they're starting to come up with their own innovative ways. But at the same time, they're, you know, they're, they're copying a little bit of what's going on, but it's because that's how we are interacting on the other platforms. And so these, you know, YouTube has YouTube shorts now for some people. Mm-hmm. I think if you have to have 10 thousand followers but mm-hmm. we're starting to see it this is the culture of how we're using social media and so it's i don't have a problem with the platforms sort of like copying each other it's because we're used to use i mean you see less posts now less actual real posts in the facebook feed and even in instagram but you see more stories because that's how people are sharing what's going on in their life and so why wouldn't linkedin follow that that you know because that's the culture of how we're using social media now so i think businesses should definitely pay attention to this and i think just like we were saying earlier don't overthink it like don't be like oh we have to figure this out and develop a strategy for stories before we start using stories just start using it just start using it start having fun with it and figure it out as you go and pay attention to what happens you never know what may happen so um, I do think the short form piece uh, makes it, you do have to think through that, but all that also makes it kind of like a little less risky, right? Cause it's going to be gone in 24 hours. Right. And that's, and that's the one thing I will say that I, I do think about stories is, is a great feature is the fact that it does go away, that you can put, uh, more stuff out there. Definitely. Yeah. And, um, so I know we've got a lot of really great questions here as well around this. I would say like the one So I know people are going to ask like, well, hey, how do I make, what content do I make for my stories? And the one thing that I would say is this, like, if you watch that, that LinkedIn video that we shared, it showed the three updates. And when it got to the stories feature, what was it showing? It was showing, you know, just a quick like clip of somebody working on, for example, a presentation, um, you know, or they were working on a conference. Um, They were, you know, showing a couple like, hey, we got some new products in. Like it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, you just need to think about like what your business creates during the day. And, you know, and if you're not sure what to create, the good thing is there's a lot of examples out there. You just have to go to other social media platforms, look at the stories, content they're sharing yep, and then see, you know, is that something that would work for me or, or does it not? Um, so I want to make sure we get to some of these questions, by the way, Jim, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of yeah uh, and and, and Leticia so, gave you I, I don't know if that's a super chat so you gotta so. share cool. that with me and Mel since we made you money today. <laughs> got it got it yes I'll go ahead and share that here let's see I love Very it cool. so that's cool this is actually the third each I, that's the first time I've seen that come so we're using StreamYard uh yeah. you know to go live of course and mm-hmm. uh, today I did wear my StreamYard shirt the other day you guys had the sweatshirts on and I thought I better show up today in my in my gear. And uh, I was thinking you were, and then I was like, oh, Jim's not got his one. So I don't have mine. Hilarious. So, um, I that's the first time I've seen that inside of, you know, I can see the comments, of course, too, which is another reason why I love uh StreamYard because your guests can also see comments. And that's the first I've seen that. That's super cool. Christian, have you have you had that in your shows before with StreamYard? Uh, I've not had the super chats, no. So this is awesome. This is yeah. cool. It's really easy to see it, it nice and it's green um and it highlights very well. So yeah. Um, awesome. But thank you, Leticia, for that. Very much appreciated. Um, okay, so let's see. So let's make sure we get some of these questions real quick, and then we're going to move on to the second topic real quick. Yeah, I did, so, I did see, I did want to answer, uh, I saw a question about hashtags mm-hmm. and uh, trademarking yeah. it. You're not going to be able to do that. Uh, but I will say a good idea. Judy Fox does this. Create your own unique hashtag. Judy Fox uses hashtag Fox Rocks, tells mm-hmm. her followers to follow that. So anytime she posts content, she adds that hashtag in there. And so you can go search in LinkedIn for the mm-hmm. hashtag and you'll see all the posts that are using that hashtag. So she also then knows who, how many people are following it. Yeah. And it's it just a great way to kind of build community around your hashtag. And then you can, you know, you can use a hashtag mm-hmm. on so many platforms now yeah. that, uh, it's a great idea. You know, first it may just be you and a couple people, but uh, if you stay consistent with it, I, I think that's the the way to approach the uh, the hashtag strategy. I like Definitely, it, yeah. Cr- Christian. I would not recommend your last name be in the hashtag for you. I no. think that <laughs> there'll be very a Good lot point. of variations of it. 
<laughs> Very good. Exactly. And uh, speaking of hashtags, so before we get to Leticia's question here about uh, the LinkedIn profile and the LinkedIn company page, um, I want to just address the hashtag thing as well. So, you know, if you're like, I have one for this show, it's called hashtag social chatter. However, you know, you don't want to, don't just use like the generic hashtag. So you are going to want to look and so for starters, make sure you do your research regardless of what hashtag you want to use. If you said, Hey, you know what? I've got this great idea for a hashtag. Sounds awesome. Um, go and search. Like if you're on Twitter, search.twitter.com. Uh, YouTube has this feature as well. So you can put like three hashtags on YouTube, go search different platforms and see uh, what actually shows up when people are using that hashtag. Uh, because you want to make sure you don't accidentally pick something in it. You know, it's not your fault, but you may pick a hashtag that people uh, have used for other things. And it's not to say you can't use that hashtag. Um, sometimes the topics are off. So like somebody was trying to use one for like a, there was like a drunk driving uh, initiative at some point, And then it ended up being, they want to use another hashtag. And then someone else had already used that for something else that was not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so, um, mm -hmm. they're definitely, you know, it, they didn't do the research. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look good if you start using the hashtag. So, um, just start there. So then, uh, I want to answer Letitia's question here, Jem uh, and Melanie. So how do I update the profile or sorry? So do I update the profile I already have, or just create a company LinkedIn page? Both. Both. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was perfect. Start, start with your profile first and then get, get to the page. But at least, yeah. It, and even the page won't take that long. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're going to need your logo. Uh, you know, you can create a, a header. There's, the, you know, and I don't know if you're using Canva, Adobe Spark. A lot of these platforms have built in kind of that template to make sure that your header is the right size. And then you can get uh, get creative with it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with Mel. Both. Um, mm -hmm. We're not going to let you off the hook. Nope, and exactly. I agree. Start with the personal one and the company one. Jim, you made it. You said it perfectly earlier. Just get it started so that it's there. Because when you when you create that company page, you are also going to want to make sure you attach it yes. to your personal profile. So when after you create the company page, go back to your personal profile, and then when you click on the name of your business that's mm -hmm. in your profile, like that you work at you want to make sure you update it and link it. Because now that you have the company page, you can link it and it'll actually pull the logo in and it'll be a hyperlink to that company page now. So there's kind of like a two-step approach there. But to Jim's point earlier, just start it and then just build upon it as you go. But you don't have to like build it all. You said an hour, Jim. That was like, you're going to scare people away. I think she could have this cranked out in 20 minutes. I truly do. Now, and, well, I was giving her time to think. You, yeah, you're right. That's true. 20, well, see, 20 minutes, people might be scared. Like, oh my gosh, I got to do that. <laughs> Um, and I want to I want to bring up a couple of things real quick here. Uh, so we had a question here. This was uh, from Laura. She's asking the question of how do I uh, I have connections in a specific field? How do I tie together my connections? Um, so if you create the company page, so that's so you log in your so it's like Facebook. You log into Facebook as your profile. You create a page or a group or things like that. Uh, same exact process on LinkedIn. I create a LinkedIn profile. Then I go and create the company page. And then um, what I want to do is I want to show you this. So then it's going to look like something like this. So this is my LinkedIn profile. And then as you can see here, for example, this is Launcher Live. Um, I basically just added uh, a new experience. And so, for example, if I click on this, it's going to take us over to the company page that we have. Um, and that's literally just at tagging the LinkedIn uh, company page. So that's pretty much all you're going to have to do there. Um, let me see if there's any other questions here. And then we're going to... And actually, I also like this comment, by the way, new to Instagram, old to Facebook, freshening up LinkedIn. I mm -hmm. like that, actually. Um, a lot of people, you know, they um, they stick with the same stuff they have all the time. You want, you know, but I like Mel's advice, which is pick one, get really, and this is the same thing I teach, like pick one, get really good at it, and then build the next one and the next one and the next one, because the fundamentals are going to be the same once you've learned them. Okay, let's see. Um and then one last question real quick here, by the way. Uh, does the LinkedIn company page uh, have to be the same content as the business page? Do you mean your profile? Uh, now, I will say, uh, I believe what Judy Fox likes to do sometimes is she'll post something on her company page and then shares that to her personal profile as opposed to taking the personal profile stuff and sharing it to the company page. And you can tag people in both. And so I think that's uh, actually a great thing to, to do uh, as well. And I did, I did want to hit on somebody earlier. It said they have sure. like side hustles and, you know, 
Does LinkedIn frown upon that? I, I think what happens is, like Mel said, we used to look at LinkedIn as it was our business resume, but they now, they want, right, they're encouraging pages. So yeah, you can absolutely add your part-time, if you want to call it, positions, if it's something that you're legitimately trying to grow. And I would encourage you to do that. And that's why I tell podcasters and live streamers, if you have a show with a place you want people to go, why not create that company page so people can learn more about the the shows and podcasts that you're putting out there? Yeah. And I want to um, hit on that because what they're talking about is actually personal profiles. None of the platforms want you to have multiple personal profiles because we are right. one human being, but mm -hmm. you can have side hustles and passions and those are when you make business pages. So Facebook business pages, one for each project or one for each you know business that you run. LinkedIn's are different. They, they never frowned upon multiple company pages. They frowned upon multiple personal profiles. Right. And because we are just one human, right? And they want you to be one individual. Um, and that's what that's what that was. So um, gotcha. they really never did frown upon the multiple business pages um, for that. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that. And Letitia's, uh, I think it was Letitia's question about company page versus business page. Does mm -hmm. the content need to be the same? Uh, just just to kind of close this one up, I think that you know what you were talking about earlier with you know share something on the company page and then share it to your personal profile. That strategy is effective on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. um, but in case she was asking. Facebook business page versus LinkedIn company uh, page. Does the content need to be the same? I think you can absolutely, again, repurpose your content. What I always recommend people do is that when you create a, a post and if it works for LinkedIn, sometimes you have to tweak the language or how you phrase something because, again, the culture and the mindset of the user is different. When we're on LinkedIn, we're, we're in a different mindset than when we're on Facebook. However, I always recommend you share them at different times of the day or even maybe a day or two apart. And here's why. Usually when we do a social media check-in, we don't just go to Instagram. We pretty much, everybody has a routine. You open up your phone, you check and see if anybody's texted you, you look at your email really quick, you'll check Facebook notifications, you might look at your Instagram notifications and you might check out LinkedIn. We do this in a in a, a bit of a, um, we don't just go check one thing, we typically do what I call a social media drive-by. We kind of go check all of them. So if you're publishing something at the exact same time, I just might see it on both platforms at that same time when I see it. Now, not necessarily right when you post it, but if I if I happen to check Facebook in the morning and you posted something later in the day and I didn't see it, and then the next day I might see it over on LinkedIn because of the way the algorithms work, right? So if you if you wait and you spread it out, you actually have a better chance of people seeing it at different times. Maybe they will see it on one platform over the other. So um, just kind of wanted to say that. Well, this, idea, and, and we got a hashtag idea here. Hashtag morning drive morning by. Drive -by. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So this is the first topic that we've talked about. Um, let's talk about the second one here real quick. And I, and I know we've got like eh, about 20 minutes left in the show. So um, topic number two for the week, and this is, should be a fairly quick update, by the way. So if you're in the UK uh, or Canada, uh, you're going to have the ability to use Facebook shops. Now, this is a feature that's been around since August uh, for US users, US businesses and creators, but now it's available to people in the UK uh, in Canada. What do you guys think uh, about Facebook shops? Uh, Jem, let's start there. Well, why did they wait so long um, to, to allow this feature to roll out? And I guess my secondary question to that would be, does this then mean that this will allow Instagram shops in those countries or did they already have that feature? Because is this at times it's kind of like the chicken before the egg. Like you had to have a Facebook shop set up to get an Instagram shop. And I know that's definitely a big thing for people. Uh, you know, I haven't personally done Instagram shopping, but de definitely taking a much harder look at it now uh, as a opportunity for some businesses that I work with. Uh, so I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing to give people this feature. I will say this though, and this is a comment I've heard before, is that Facebook has lost a lot of, uh, had a lot of trust issues with people. So people aren't necessarily comfortable with shopping on Facebook. They would probably rather go shop on Amazon. So that's that's just kind of my two cents. What do you think, Mel? Yeah, I, I agree. And the whole trust issue, I, I think Jim makes a really good point there. The other thing that I think that people are starting to feel is that these platforms, when they give us these opportunities, I mean, they are taking a cut of things. So for example, like 
the whole stars on Facebook. Like if, mm-hmm. if you like want to support somebody, we get like nothing. Like you you give somebody you spend a dollar on somebody <laughs> to support them. <laughs> You're right over there. God. Yeah, but <laughs> you swallowed a star. I, I was like, what what did I say? Um, I. <laughs> We like the actual person that you're giving that dollar to gets like hardly any of it. I mean, Facebook's keeping that money, and so I do think that sometimes when I see, I personally sometimes my my little flares go off. It's like, okay, I like this. I think that yes, they want to provide businesses, especially small businesses, with a way to have a wider reach and to sell their products and and what they do. But at the same time, I'm also kind of like, mm, or is this just another one of those money making aspects? Now, granted, I support social media platforms monetizing and making money. They have to. It takes – it costs money to run and build these platforms and to support them and to keep them running. So I don't have a problem with them, like, you know, making money. It's just sometimes I think about, okay, great, I want to support that small business, and I just discovered this product. A lot of times what I do is I don't buy it through Facebook. I will actually go around and try to find a way to buy it direct because I want to make sure that that small business is making as much money as possible. Yeah, that's your a point. Great point. Yeah, and the whole Amazon thing, I do think that this is this is absolutely their way of one providing businesses with an easy simple way to to sell and to make more and to, you know, sell their products and stuff. But at the same time, you know, I do think that it's another way that they're trying to make sure they keep up with um the giants like the Amazon and all that stuff too. So, um but I I've personally not I don't think I've ever made a purchase on Facebook. I think I have through Instagram. Um, I have bought, uh, I've sold a couple things on Marketplace, but have you guys ever bought anything using Facebook shops or Instagram shops even? I think, Jim, you said no, but. Right. Well, I, now my wife has bought a couple things, but I think that wasn't necessarily a shop. It was more a Facebook ad. And mm-hmm. what ended up happening is I think both products came from China. So she told me that I'm supposed to ban her from ever buying on Facebook again. <laughs> Because it wasn't what it looked like. Right. (laughs) Well, you have to watch out for that anywhere. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh, this looks like a really cute pair of shoes. It's like, oh my gosh, this is not what it looked like. There are actually like websites dedicated to what it looked like online, what it looked like in real person. Like, and they have these comparisons and it's hilarious. Like the sweaters that come and like the sleeves are like here. Right. They're hilarious. Some of those memes out there. So so we got some, actually got a couple of good questions here, by the way. And I'll answer the same question you guys had about shops. I don't buy anything on Facebook shops, honestly. Um, I, I, Jim, I'm going to go back to like the comments that you and I've had over the last like couple of weeks, I guess. And it's the fact that if I'm going to go buy uh, something I'm going to go to Amazon or I'm going to go to, um, you know, I'm going to go to Amazon. I'm going to, I'm actually getting in the habit lately of going to the actual manufacturer's website. Um, also partly to deal with like price gouging because, mm-hmm. yep. you know, because the supply for a lot of things has been really constrained mm-hmm. over the last year. Uh, I will go directly to the website and purchase something. I might use Facebook as the idea like, Oh, Hey, I saw something that looks kind of cool, but then I want to go check it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, if they're running an ad, uh, I'm not just going to click on their ad and go buy the item. I'm actually going to go to their website and actually see if it's legit. Uh, do a little searching there. I actually might go to Amazon and look up the item and see if it's actually available on Amazon uh, because sometimes there's people selling what seems like a really awesome item. And uh, then, you know, you go like, you're like, well, if they're really awesome and it's got all these like people buying it, it should be on Amazon, for example. Um, or I'll go check out their website and uh, not necessarily finding it. So, that's kind of the way I work with this. Um, I know Letitia has a question here. Uh, by the way, yes, I am okay. Did, I, I was trying to <laughs> be quiet drinking that? water and uh, yeah, I went down the wrong uh, <laughs> either. So does Facebook uh, work for course creators? So, Facebook shops. Yeah, Facebook shops. Yes, sorry. Correct. Hmm. I want to say they want it to be products. I'm not, you know, so maybe if you had like a book, they. I don't even know if they're, good with ebooks right now i think it's got to be a physical product uh not 100 percent sure but i remember when i set my shop up it had to be products so like if i wanted to sell t-shirts sweatshirts swag i could do that but i couldn't like say hey buy an hour of my time uh you, you can't do that at as far as i know at the moment on facebook shops I think you're right. I think it is right now product based. Um, but you know, a course could be. I mean, she's talking about a course, right? So it's right. a an online course. Uh, I mean, I don't. I I would be. I kind of feel like that's probably not going to end up coming to shops because I do think that 
what their goal and their objective here is it is essentially to, you know, help these businesses expand. And it, it is mainly made for products, just like Amazon. So it's product based, um, you know, shop. So it would be, it, I don't know that there's even really. I mean, there's other ways that you can sell your courses online, of course, but um, mm -hmm. through social media, but not inside of that particular platform. But I'm sure, I'm sure there's a workaround. I'm so sure I have an idea, though. I have an idea. Mm -hmm. So you sell if, the workbook. Yeah. So here's what you could do: if Facebook doesn't, you know, again, test this out. So go to your Facebook page, set up a Facebook shop. Um, it's a setting in uh, in your Facebook page. Um, if they don't allow you to, if they only want you to let list physical products. How about you create a bundle? So what if that bundle is selling a physical product? So mm -hmm. for example, it could be a coffee mug, a t-shirt, something like that. Something that you don't necessarily have to create yourself as well. And you could bundle it with the course, for example. So that mm -hmm. way, um, you know, you are selling the t-shirt for a certain amount of money, but that t-shirt includes the course and vice versa. Yeah, you um, sell the t-shirt for $997. Exactly, That's what right? you do. It comes with a course. Don't forget that seven, by the way. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, that that would be one way to do it. I would. I wonder. You'd have to check the policies, right? You have to make sure yeah. you look and read the fine print. Um, but it certainly that would be one of the workarounds. Um, but yeah. 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 Lots of lots of options here, actually. So I'm just reading through some of the comments. Got some uh, new people actually here joining. So interesting to hear you finding it on Amazon. Legitimize the product. Cuts and distribution rules make it difficult to sell product through them. Yeah, I mean, I, I use that. I, I use that though as a bit of the measuring stick because um, I like to like if you're big enough, you're going to get your product on there. Um, I also use it to also I use it for sometimes answering questions about a product, so I don't have to deal with customer service with a lot of companies because a lot of companies customer service is non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I have a specific question about a product. A lot of times I will go and, you know, I'll look at the featured question section on Amazon uh, because I can't find the information I want. So I'll go check that out. Um, I'll look through the reviews. I, I don't, the reviews though, I don't, you do not use the reviews as my main guidance behind buying a product, but I do use the featured questions to answer certain questions I might need. You don't uh, use the reviews. That's yeah. interesting. I, I always encourage people to use reviews, especially when they're buying any type of physical like technology gear because it will look great and it'll set it I mean because you just don't know if it's gonna work until you get it and try it and so I always do the pulse check with the reviews but I I then will go like if it's physical like this stuff mm -hmm. I then go to YouTube and I'm like I want to find somebody who had I can actually hear it and like for this mic for example yeah. I want to hear it I want to see it I want their their real you know feedback but I do look at the reviews. Because in fact, that's well, recently when I bought my computer, someone mm -hmm. recommended a particular computer and then I started reading the reviews and it was like, there were, there were positive reviews, but then there were all these reviews and they were talking about the exact same issue. That's when I knew I was like, I'm not buying that computer. So I guess maybe I should rephrase. I don't, I, I read the reviews, but I don't use them as my basis. So for example, sure. if I see they have, you know, four, four stars out of five, for example, um, I will read the reviews. Chances are like I can kind of make a good observation there about if it's a good product, but I I don't use them as my guideline. So yeah. if I see a ton of people giving it really positive reviews and I see a few negative ones, I actually will skew more towards the negative side because mm -hmm. a lot of the reviews on Amazon are fake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, you have people uh, increasing their reviews so that people are then going to make the purchase. So um, that's, a, that's a great increase. point. That's a great point because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the yeah. negative reviews and those are the ones I'm reading. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so Facebook shops rolling out to the UK and Canada already in the U S. Um, and then one quick tip on that, obviously, like if you can't sell a physical, if you can't sell like a course or something, uh, through there, consider uh, maybe using a bundle of some other product with that. Uh, again, you don't have to make the items either. You don't have to make the coffee mugs, the t-shirts, the stickers, for example, that's even the cheapest product. Um, so, you could consider maybe bundling something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know we got one more topic. We got time for one topic, uh, some questions and two tools. Everybody sure. good? Yeah. Okay, so Jem, do you want to talk about the third topic for this week? Uh, do you want to go to YouTube or do you want to go with uh, Twitter? Um, let's talk about YouTube. Okay. Or, yeah. Or, actually, well, which one do you think is the more useful one for our viewers? Well, I, I think I think that YouTube coming out with the analytics is probably a more useful thing. It's just they, they didn't actually have an article. It was a... A video. Okay. So I got a screenshot. Let's go with the yeah. screenshot. Maybe okay. this work. So what's topic three for the week? Yeah. So better video uh, comparison features in YouTube analytics. And that's one of the things that I really 
like about what YouTube has been doing. They they give this stuff away, right? Now, granted, they're the second largest search engine after Google itself, which owns YouTube. But the fact that you're actually able to now start to see how many people viewed your video within the first 24 hours and and you know it'll go back all the way now to 2019 up to 100 videos i believe is what i had saw in the uh the video when i was watching it earlier so yeah. i think this is exciting right because if you're not analyzing what's going on with your socials you know you could be you know spinning your wheels wasting a lot of time so i think this is a great thing for people to know the video performance and you know, because even a lot of times, right, when we say, oh, I got, you know, X number of views on Facebook, is it a three second view? Is it a 10 second view? Um, you know, it's that's not necessarily meaning that the people stuck around and watched the whole video, which is probably a lot of times what you want. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what do you think about this, Melanie? Yeah, I think that anytime we can have data to measure what we're doing is going to be helpful. I think uh, I do think that sometimes the data can be overwhelming, and I tell people not to get too hung up on data. Again, I think that it, it's kind of a mind game. It's a catch-22. So the data is helpful. The analytics are helpful. And so pay attention to it because it is going to help you. But do not give – like I think that if people pay too much attention to the data, they actually will give up. Like they will stop because, oh, my God, only three people watched my live video. Well, yeah, but – you know, that's how you're getting started, right? I, I remember doing many live videos where nobody watched live, mm -hmm. you know, so the data is there to help you, but do not overthink the data. Like, I think that it's very good to see what's working. I think data really comes into play when you have a, a larger quantity of stuff to start to look at, because then you can say, okay, great. You know, don't, like, don't look at it at such a granular level is what I, I guess I'm getting at. Look at it more at that macro level. Is that right? Macro versus micro? Yeah. Because you want to look and say, okay, I have out of these 20 videos that I've done. Look at this one. This one spiked. Okay, now what am I going to, now you're going to go deep there. That's where you're going to go to the micro level and say, okay, why did people like that video so much? Look at everything like the title of it, the description, um, the topic, the comments, right? And so that's where the data really helps. So I think it's great that YouTube is, is, is adding more of this and giving us more information. Um, I just think that it, it, it is useful, but don't, don't let it become a crutch, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So uh, so in addition to this, by the way, so in addition to, uh, and we've got some questions here, by the way, as well on this. So in addition to um, giving you comparative data, you'll be able to see the top performing videos, the bottom performing videos. So you'll be able to see things like impressions. So so uh, how many impressions is this getting seen? Uh, and then also how many people are viewing? So impressions are like, okay, so somebody saw it, great, but they didn't take an action on it. Mm -hmm. I.e. they didn't sit there and watch the video. Um, you'll be able to see how much time they watch uh, the average percentage that they watch of your video and all of these things also to, you know, to really think about, I mean, when you're making like a YouTube video, Gem, I know you and I've talked about this. I think it was about a live stream and we said, Hey, how long should you live stream for? And the answer is it depends. And it depends on, um, how long your viewers are tuning in and your data is going to tell you this. It's going to tell you this for your pre-recorded videos, or any video you're putting up on YouTube since 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's going to show you those, uh, the last 100, and then, you know, the benefit here is that if you're watching a video and let's say it's, let's say, you know, we should, part of this, we should trust our own intuition, you know, and if we are doing a video that's 10 minutes long and we feel like it's too long, let's look at the data once we put it out there and see what that actually tells us. It might tell us, you know what, hey, people only watch 40% uh, of it. They watch four minutes of it, for example, you know, and so if that's the case, then we need to consider shortening it. And it's not saying, oh, I need to shorten it like now. I need to work on tightening it up to where it's this really tight package. I mean, think about the videos that you watch on YouTube. Why do you watch them? Mm -hmm. Part of the time, it's because they're short, they're to the point, and they aren't rambling on and on and on about something. And there's easily a lot of you know film that can be left on the cutting room floor. So you want to work, you know, take that long video and then work to shrink it down to where it's a really good quality video all the time. Um, is there anything else y'all want to add on this feature, by the way, before we answer a couple questions? No, I just think, uh, you know, t t definitely take a look at it, see if it helps you uh, with your YouTube strategy, if uh, if that's something you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just a couple of points here. So if you want to get to the new charts, you simply go to your channel analytics on YouTube. There's an advanced mode, and then you'll have, for example, the ability to compare to like the first 24 hours video performance. Um, you'll also be able to see other channels that your audience watches. So this is a good comparison feature as well. So if you're kind of wondering, well, who might, so Letitia, you asked the question of, do, do they show you 
uh, the names of the people who viewed your videos, they do not show that, but you can get an idea of the people that are viewing your content. So if you look at the other channels, uh, you, your audience watches, this can give you an idea of potentially who your audience is. Like if, for example, if they're watching a lot of uh, cooking videos or they're watching a lot of videos on um, gaming, for example, and you're like, well, hey, I'm not in any of these fields, you're probably just getting a bunch of trolls watching your mm -hmm. videos. Um, so that would be that side. And then let me see, if, are there any other questions here, Jim, that you see? Uh, Letitia had a question, I think it was Letitia, about live minutes, does it count towards monetization? That's a really great question. That definitely does. That that definitely counts towards monetization. So, but the one key you gotta, there's two two things. One is a thousand subs, right, Jim? Mm -hmm. And then the other flip side of it is 4,000 hours of continuous watch time. Over so, the last th 365 days, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. let's say, let's say like the first, like let's say you start getting, doing really well in your videos and then all of a sudden something happens and it tanks. So as it's rolling, you could be like, you could be a hundred, you could be like 50 hours away of watch time. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you had a really bad month and now you're 250 hours away. So um, the key thing is you're going to want to be putting out, you know, some longer videos to get people to tune in, but also um, making sure that you're putting out quality content. So it's, it's a bit of a battle. You know, mm -hmm. you're always going to have to be working at it, uh, but you can get monetized. So it doesn't, it's not, it's not hard, but you need to just make sure you're putting out the right kind of content. Yeah. And just to clarify, because I think a lot of people get this confused is it's 365 days, 4,000 minutes. I know this because this is my goal. <laughs> I'm not at that point, but it's 4,000 minutes the last 365 days. Is it tomorrow, minutes or hours? It's minutes, sorry, minutes. Um, tomorrow, it's the last 365 days. Then the next day, the last 360. It's, so as Christian said, it's always rolling. And so you can't just hit that and be like, sweet, I hit it. I mean, it's not like, you know, you hit gold status with an airline and you have it for a year. You have to contend, you have to maintain it. And so that is really important. And so if you have this huge month and you have this big spike, then you got to know that that spike eventually will expire. So make sure you're keeping it up and keep going with it. And, and it is uh, hours, by the way. So it's four thousand hours. Hours, sorry. Did yeah. I say I've said minutes, didn't I? So, yeah. so hours. one thing to think about. Excited for a minute. Oh, sorry. So, uh, Jim's like, oh man, yeah. So like four thousand hours would be like super easy. So the thing you'd have to do Three here minutes. is, minutes. <laughs> um, so one thing <laughs> to think minutes. about if you want to get there. Let's just think about the content, and, and this is where it does get to be a challenge. So if you're making short form video content, things that are like five minutes or less, right? Just add that up. That's a lot of videos that people have to watch. Mm -hmm. So it has to, so like our attention span has gotten to a point where people want shorter videos, but yet you need to get to 4,000 hours. So that's a lot you really have to kind of balance there. So if you're making, I, I would almost say mix it up. I would mm -hmm. say maybe do some short videos, but then maybe have a 30 minute or a one hour live stream. And then that way, if you're doing that, you're able to get to that monetization, I think faster. Provided, obviously, also you optimize it properly with keywords and, and get people to view it. Yeah, I totally agree with that strategy. That's, I mean, that's essentially, I think, a, an effective strategy is because a live stream. So here's the thing. And Christian said it's a balance because when you come in, and I'm not a YouTube expert by any means. I am literally an accidental YouTuber where I had one video, it happened to like explode. And now, I, now that I'm live streaming and multi-streaming, YouTube is definitely part of my strategy right now. So, but one of the things you have to think about is, let's say you create a five minute tutorial about something, fantastic. Well, people are gonna keep coming back because they're gonna be searching for that answer and they're gonna keep coming and they're gonna watch that video. But then when somebody lands on some Q&A that you did and they look at it and it's like an hour and a half long, most people are gonna be like, oh, I'm not watching that, I'm out, right? So a lot of times those live streams, while they are longer and there's more minutes consumed, like Letitia here is a great contributor to your guys' watch time right now, right? Because she's been on this uh, live stream the whole time over on YouTube. But from a replay standpoint, you're not going to necessarily get all those pe people to watch the whole replay, right? So those chapter markers that you can add are going to help somebody say, okay, well, what did they talk about during this 90-minute live stream or whatever it is? Then the, if you put those chapter markers in there, then you're going to actually increase the possibility that they are going to watch at least part of it. So the live, the longer live videos, while they get you that good push when you initially go live, from a replay standpoint, there are going to be less people that are going to consume the whole thing. So having that mix is important because those five, 10 minute tutorial videos or whatever it is that you talk about, those videos are going to get consumed from a, hey, I'm going to watch this video that they published six months ago. So I do think the mix is definitely the way to go. Uh, and just real quick, we've got a couple of 
points here as well as just to clarify. So the first thing is you have to have both. Mm -hmm. So if you get to 4,000 hours, that's awesome, but you still need the thousand subs. Yep. So, you know, there's a formula. I mean, seriously, if you watch any YouTube video, it's the formula is going to be virtually the same. Hey, I'm so-and-so. Thanks a lot for tuning in today. We're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Before we begin, uh, please click the like button and hit, you know, like button and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Like if you watch any video, you're going to see the same formula mm -hmm. um, because they want those subs. And then they do the same thing at the end. Again, it's reinforcement. Um, so, but you're going to want to make sure you're doing that to get both of those items. Um, and then one last uh, point from Letitia here as well. Uh, she said um, she has an idea. So I'm glad she's getting a lot of value out of this show. Nice. So this is awesome. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to just a couple of questions real quick for Melanie. You know, I know today we talked about YouTube, uh, LinkedIn company page updates. We talked about uh, Facebook shops expanding the UK and Canada. We just talked about the YouTube studio comparison data that they're now making available to you. Um, so what I want to do is I want to just ask a couple of questions uh, or ask Melanie a couple of questions. And, and these are, you know, so let's, Jim, do you want to, do you have the questions by the way, Jim, or do you want me to? Yeah, no, I can, uh, I can pull the questions up. Okay. We may have, um, we, and, and we, we may have answered. covered some of it. Yeah. Yeah. So they could be quick, but. That's right. Let me get them up here. I had to move my chair earlier because it was blocking my lava lamp. I was like, <laughs> oh man. Let's see. Question one for Mel was, um, what are some ways that businesses can uh, curate uh, experience for employees on other social media platforms, LinkedIn company pages, et cetera. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, I mean, I think it goes back to be a, think of yourself as a journalist. I think when you are creating content and you want to curate, you know, what's going on with your employees, well, look at yourself as the journalist and what, you know, what can you explain this happening? So I do like the stories feature with LinkedIn, the company profiles. And I think that What's kind of cool is that when these uh, social media platforms are using similar styles in the formats that we can create, you can create a story on one platform. Let's say you start with Instagram, and then you can actually download that to your phone, and then you could repurpose that exact same content. Again, I think it will probably be the same um, on Facebook, on a Facebook page, and then, of course, now LinkedIn company pages. And so I, th I love the idea about when you showcase your employees and, t and share the good news. What are they doing? What's happening? And right now, if your employees are all virtual, you may have to reach out to your employees and say, hey, we want you to share with us you know, create a little video of yourself at your home desk or whatever, right? And that way you can still show this culture of your company, even though you're not all in the same office building together. I think that's kind of one of the challenges that companies are facing right now when it comes to share showcasing employees is they're not around their employees. Everybody's virtual. So you may have to involve some of your staff, but I think that when you can share like the positive things that they're working on or the things that they're doing, results from projects they're working on, um, you're doing a couple things. You're actually... Um, putting a positive a positivity in the culture of your business and you're rewarding and you're showcasing people, people like to get credit for the good things they're doing. It makes them feel good. And then the other thing you're doing is you're showing off that part of the culture of your business too. And so other people from a prospective employee standpoint or even a prospective customer, they're going to appreciate you more because you're showcasing those employees. So um, I don't know if that fully answered that question, but that was my that's my idea. I think you have to showcase employees in your business for – many reasons. I think one, it makes them feel good. And two, you're showing that off to the rest of the world. And the the fringe benefit is prospective employees are going to want to come work for a company that shares the good news about their employees. And two, customers might even appreciate you more because you are sharing and I'm getting, I'm building a relationship with your, your team. Fantastic. So Jim, what's the second question? Yeah, the, uh, the second one is what would be a great strategy for people to get uh, in the stories? Cause I know you did hit on that a little bit earlier. I'm sorry, you have to repeat it because I was distracted by oh, a close-up lava, lava lamp, lamp would yes. be a good cut to occasionally. One? Yes, <laughs> I love that yeah. idea. Yeah, I the love that uh, idea. the um, how would how would what's a good st strategy? How how can people get started with stories? Oh, great. Okay, so honestly, as I always say with everything, the best way to get started is to just get started. Um, honestly, just like have some fun with it. Just try try some experiments. But you guys made this comment earlier. Go look and see what other companies are doing and model after them. Don't copycat what they're doing, but get ideas from what they're doing. That's the easiest way to get started because I think where people get the roadblock is two places. One, they don't know what to post. 
They're like, what are we going to put in our story? Okay, well, go look at what other people are doing and get ideas from what they're doing. There's your solution right there. And then the other limitation of people getting started is, you like you guys were talking about earlier. Um, well, we don't. I don't like how we look on camera, or I don't like. I don't think we have the right equipment or whatever. Throw that out the window. You don't need anything. All you need is a phone and some a natural light. So face a window, grab your phone, and create a little short clip and a video. Um, and then I think as and that's the best way to get started is to just do content of yourself or content like these short little clips, these little videos. Um, but get ideas from other people, and then as you start to realize what's working. You can then start to introduce maybe some design tools and, and actually involve your designer and, and actually have a strategy where you sit down and plan the content. But to get started, don't overthink it. Just get started and just start creating content. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. So we've got third act real quick for the show. I realized we actually went over this time, like a little bit over actually. Um, so we're going to get to just tool time. And this is where we have uh, two tools that we... Uh, we think can help you as a business owner. Um, Jim, what's the first tool that you want to dis- that we want to discuss this week? The uh, it, it's called the Screencast-O-Matic, I, th- yes. I believe. Yes. Yes. Okay, so let me pull this up, and then I'm gonna have Melanie tell you about it because I think you've used this, right? Oh yeah, yeah. This was this is a tool that I absolutely love. I use this tool all the time. Um, so-, so what? What is it? Let's start with this. Yes. What, what is Screencast-O-Matic? And then let's talk about the cost of this product. Yeah. So it's it's essentially a screen capture tool. Okay. But okay. it's more than that. So you can create screencasts. So videos. So I, you can use it to do tutorials and, you know, like literally show somebody. You guys could have done, for example, a quick screencast of the analytics for YouTube and talked about it and shown it, right? I, if you go to my YouTube channel, you will see any tutorial I've done. I probably used Screencast-O-Matic to create that tutorial video. But you can also, what I like about it is it's different than a lot of the Screencast tools because you can toggle back and forth between you being on camera, on screen, either full screen or down in the lower corner. So another comparative tool that a lot of people are aware of is Loom. But mm. I like Screencast-O-Matic for a couple of reasons more so. And the one is that this toggle feature. I can literally start out fully on screen and record myself talking about what I'm about to show you and then literally just click a button and then it will like put me down into the corner. Very similar to the way StreamYard works, you know, when we share our screen. Mm. Um, and then I can do the tutorial. It's got great post-production editing tools, which I think is how it's different than others. So you can literally go in and you can add lower thirds, you can add music, you can do a lot of things. You can actually cut out parts of your video. You can also, this is what's really, really cool, is as long as you recorded that webcam, you may get in the middle of the video and say, you know what, I actually, even though I'm in the lower corner, now it's hiding part of the screen I'm showing, I kind of actually want to change that. You can actually edit that post-production. You can even move it into a different location. And so oh. the post-production editing of this tool is what I think makes it great. I use this to c- create my course videos. Like I said, I use it all the time. The other thing that's really great is similarly to Loom is let's say, for example, somebody asks a question in your Facebook group. You Mm -hmm. can literally go record a quick video and say, you know what? It's easier for me to show you how to do that. So I recorded this quick video for you. So you can record the video, upload it to the cloud, and then just share the link. And then they literally, I mean, you don't have to download it to your computer if it's just simply for a quick answer. This is a great way to delight your group members or anyone you're supporting because instead of you just typing a response, you are literally like, put yourself on camera, say, hey. And, you know, you know, hey, Letitia, you had a really great question about company pages. I'm actually going to just show you really quick where you go to start to create that company page. And then you go to the screencast version, show her how, and then literally you say upload to the cloud. And then you just say, hey, Letitia, you had a great question, but I recorded a video for you and then put the link there. Um, So I love this tool for a lot of reasons. I think the other thing that's great about it is it's dirt cheap. This thing is so freaking cheap. Yeah, even Um, even the (laughs) premiere. I mean, yeah. Four, I mean, four it, bucks for you know forty eight dollars for a year. That's yeah, uh, it's so cheap, and they cheap. they are changing the um. They're always. I started using this tool when it was like nothing, like nobody knew about it. I mean, it was like here for eleven dollars a year, you can use this tool, and I was like, this thing's amazing. And they've continued to make it better. One thing that's limiting right now, I actually sent them. I actually recorded a video, and I was like, you guys need to change this. <laughs> and it's that you cannot currently. It's very tricky to use a um, like a HD camera, like a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera as your webcam. So we can be using that. We're all using. Uh, you know, Jim and I, or not Jim, uh, Christian and I are both using Sony cameras right now, and we're going into a capture device. Well, 
Unfortunately, Screencast-O-Matic, when you go to select that capture card, like the CamLink 4K, for example, it is not supported. Now, they're working on it, but it's not there yet. So if you want to be using a super high-end camera, you are going to be limited. But if you have a good webcam, uh, you know, then you can actually use this for all kinds of things. But so that's the one thing that it's li that is limited to right now. But I'm hopeful that they'll get that added soon. Nice. Awesome. And do, so, do you have the deluxe or the premiere plan? I actually have the premiere plan, but I used the deluxe forever. But I mean, I have the premiere plan because of the um, there's a couple of features that I wanted to unlock. Uh, but it's I, most people aren't even going to need the pr the premiere plan at all. So. Nice. Awesome. And I was going to say, yeah, when, when I look at the price, I was like, is there a typo here? I mean, no. for no. a couple of dollars, you get, you know, the video editor, you get the ability to record your computer audio, mm -hmm. you get sound effects, you get scripted recording. So a lot of people use separate programs. Yes. For, yeah, there is. Um, a, you, know, you, can, you can actually have the script curve. on there. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. Uh, the screenshot tool, the green screen f filter. I mean, and then you're basically just paying for the bandwidth. So more bandwidth, um, an ad branded ad free site. And then I guess you get stock library access and custom video player and controls mm -hmm. uh with the premiere option so uh these all make a lot of sense i mean definitely so mm -hmm. uh, i would say this i mean there's lots of tools out there um this though i mean for literally 20 bucks a year mm -hmm. i mean that's what it, like uh, it works on a mac and a pc too by the way so a lot yeah. so there are some other great tools out there but they're either pc only or mac only this works on both awesome okay. fantastic mm -hmm. so what's the second tool we have this week jim yeah, it's a. It looks like it's a Windows uh, program. It's called SpaceDesk.net, and it allows you to have multiple monitors, as you can see, kind of the look. It's uh, which is which is pretty cool. Uh, if you've got if you got that kind of space, um, mm -hmm. but from what I could tell, you know, I'm a Mac uh, Mac guy. I uh, I you think it's this. Windows only when I was looking at the the software, but it definitely looks like something that could be. Of use to somebody that has multiple monitors. I think I'm and now. I want to go buy another monitor and put it on the wall. <laughs> yeah. So they do have a secondary machines option. If you look at that uh, screen that was just up, actually, it did look like it. So if you look at this uh, thing that's on the screen there, it looks like there's an Apple logo there. Okay. Um. So maybe it does work with that. But the the way this could be very useful is, you know, I think partly if you're setting up a lot of displays for things, um, it's a way to also extend those displays across the displays versus having everything kind of in a box, um, you know, having to be everything self-contained. So that's mm -hmm. one that could be an option there. But again, this is a free option. Um, it's for somebody that, you know, if you want, uh, if you've got a lot of monitors, for example, you need to be able to look at a lot of things um, at one time, definitely something that could be useful. But it primarily works if you're displaying this at like maybe a conference or mm -hmm. an in-person event. I mean, if you tried to do this during a live stream, for example, you could have it in the background of, uh, for you. Yes. But the only downside, it would be, you know, um, partly like the reflection and then you probably have to flip it and all the other fun stuff, but uh, definitely another tool to check out again. I mean, we try to find new and interesting tools, um, things that can be useful for you versus just recommending the same old tools. You know, I, that, I'm excited it, about that one though. Honestly, yeah. sorry, I, I cut you off Christian. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry about that. I, I got, I'm excited. I'm like geeking out because literally now that I'm, so this, this microphone that I'm using, the Elgato Wave 3 comes with a virtual audio mixer software. It, I mean, I can literally, mm -hmm. if I wanted to right now, I could push music in to this stream right now if I wanted to through me. And that having that mixer up and I'm, I'm starting to use this more in my streams and like playing music. And I then lately I've been also exploring different ways to do countdown timers. And again, what I, one of the things I love about StreamYard is you can kind of like duct tape it and bolt it onto other applications and use these things together. And, but what I'm running into is monitor space. I'm like, okay, I'm doing a screen share, but I also need to have that virtual audio mixer up and I have to minimize it. So having that other monitor, maybe even up on the wall, you know, behind me over here. You could even, if you have a, your desk is big enough, you could get a uh, clamp. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and go, go above. Yeah. yeah, I can now use something like that where I would be able to put, you know, the the the, the tools that I need to be able to, ex you know, have access to and see over there, but then have this clean desktop for a PowerPoint slide or a tutorial a that I'm doing. I do a lot of screencasts when I do, like you are in this production, when I do my live videos. So th that got me excited because I'm like, what? I could totally now have like another monitor and have it kind of somewhere else and use that thing for it. So, but Definitely. I love the idea for conferences and stuff too. Like, you know, having, I, I've been seeing uh, a lot of ads from Sage and they'll have these pictures of, 
somebody on a virtual stage. They're on a stage, but literally they're they're by themselves in the room and they have like five monitors up and it's like they're using Zoom or something and they have all these, they're seeing all the people, the attendees of their virtual conference. Um, it makes me wonder if they're using something kind of like that uh, to do that. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, chances are they're doing something like that. There is There used to be one for like Twitter as well where you could do, uh, you could send certain things to certain screens for Twitter, like mm. tweets that were going on and they could be displayed in certain ways. Uh, versus, oh, let me just show you what Twitter looks like. So there mm -hmm. were they're very creative ways. Um, but that's the second tool we have for you this week called Space Desk. So awesome. This has been, by the way, a really good show. I mean, I know we ran a little bit longer. Or maybe I say a little bit. We ran quite a bit longer than normal. <laughs> um, but this has been an awesome show. Um, so I just have a, uh, we're going to wrap things up. Um, but I got a couple of quick points here. Um, first one is uh, if you want to get on our email newsletter, just go to socialchefs.com slash daily, uh, sign up for the newsletter, and um, I'll send you an email when we publish a new post uh, on the site or even new YouTube video. Now, Melanie, I know uh, you're on a number of social media platforms, but what's the best place for people to connect with you? I mean, it's been absolutely a blast having you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm probably part of the reason we went over because I tend to geek out kind of hardcore. But um, no, I would say if you're a YouTuber and you love to consume content on YouTube, then definitely go find me on YouTube. It's Melanie Diane, D-Y-A-N-N. -N. But if you want to connect and you want to actually network and learn and continue to share what you can share with other people too, if you're a DIY marketer, I would say go over to Facebook and join my Facebook group. It's called DIY Marketing with Melanie. It's full of a bunch of people. Kevin McAleer is in here. Laura Williams is in here. They're all part of my group. And we basically basically just have a lot of fun together. We learn all this stuff together and we share our wins. And I do um, content in there. I'm helping you basically just get into action with your marketing DIY style. That's really what I do because we do it scrappy, but scrappy doesn't have to be crappy. That's what I would say. Fantastic. And Jim, I know, uh, I know we've got Launcher Live, the podcast, but what's the best place for people to get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn at uh, Jim Fuse or also at uh, Twitter at uh, Fusion Marketing. I'm pretty active there. Uh, Probably, probably uh, between that and LinkedIn, those two places I like to hang out. I, I, I get in Facebook groups, you know, I, I think, I can't remember if I've joined your group yet, uh, Melanie. I definitely will. I think that sounds like fun. And uh, I know even the other day we were, we were geeking out after the podcast with yeah. uh, trying to help Christian with his, uh, <laughs> yeah. one of his challenges. We were, but, no. <laughs> we were. And everyone, by the way, Jim is not using a green screen. It looks right. so, like, like it really does kind of look like a green screen, but we were giving Christian a hard time about his backdrop, which is... They want me to replace my background. So my His backdrop, background is it. very scrappy. Let's put it that yes. way. But it's not o crappy. Overly scrappy. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, uh, I want to thank everybody for watching uh, episode 280 of Social Chatter, your weekly social media marketing news talk show. Again, we've got a blog post going out this weekend, socialchefs.com slash SC280. It'll cover the topics that we talked about, but we also had a couple we didn't talk about because we value your time and we only want to share the best with you. Um, so we also have an Alexa flash briefing as well. You can listen to that on your mobile device. Just download the Alexa app. Um, in addition to that, uh, we will be back next, what is this, next Thursday. Let me just make sure I got the times right here. Uh, we're going to have uh, Julie Riley on. Nice. Uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, she's the social media manager at StreamYard. So um, she's going to be our guest next week. First time having her on. And we're going to be tuning in on uh, YouTube.com or broadcasting to YouTube.com slash social chefs or Facebook.com forward slash social chefs. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, it has been an absolute blast. I love all the questions. Uh, and the comments and just the advice and just, you know, love being able to help you all. So thanks a lot for tuning in and we'll see you all next Thursday. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.